Uh, hello everyone, a warm welcome to all of you this afternoon. This is um, another event for our Black History Year series. My name is Julia Hendricks and I'm an academic engagement librarian and writer and I'm hosting this event on behalf of the Black History Year Steering Group and the School of Social Sciences at the University of Westminster. I'm very pleased to be here with our guest. Uh, please welcome Patricia Foster McKenley. Patricia is an award-winning poet, performer and life coach. She was Sable's poetry, poet in residence from 2014 to 2017, a featured poet at Mboka Festival in the Gambia and the host of At the Inquell in London. She's also an alumni of Malaika's Poetry Kitchen, which is where we met. Uh, Patricia will share how the intense uh, period of the COVID pandemic and spotlight on global black trauma has informed her writing, revealing her own intersectionality and place in society. Uh, there will be time for a Q&A, brief Q&A session at the end, and you're invited to put your questions into the chat. Uh, before we begin, uh, I'd just like to remind you that the event is being recorded and will be available on our blog site, um, the details of which you'll be sent at the end of this event. Over to you, Patricia. Good afternoon, everybody. If you're in the UK, good morning. If you're in another time zone, good evening. Um, it's a real honour and pleasure to be here today. Um, some of you may have been at um, the event when it was, we attempted to, to um, host it before. So this is actually rescheduled. Um, some of you may know why it was rescheduled. Um, and I just share that it was interrupted um, by people who may not be sort of uh, supportive of the material and the content. So we're um, undeterred, we rescheduled it and we know that um, this is going to be sort of a positive space, um, but we'll, we are obviously going to be talking about things that may, um, well, you know, may be uncomfortable for some people, but I want to know that, I want you all to know that at the end, you know, you want, you will feel safe, you feel embraced um, and able just to sort of get through this difficult time. Um, thank you to the University of Westminster for having me and uh, for Julia and um, for, for your warm welcome. Um, so I'll just start by giving a, you know, a brief insight into why I wanted to do this talk. As Julia mentioned, um, it's about um, how writing and how the power of writing has sort of informed me and my writing practice during what has been a very, very challenging 18 months to near two years or so. Um, we are in the middle of a pandemic um, and um, things, you know, have become sort of heightened as well. I'm just going to change the screen. Um, so this is going to be um, essentially a sort of um, personal perspective as well. Now, I just want to start with this quote that I found by um, the wonderful writer, Tony Morrison. And I think it sort of reflects what we're sort of doing here today and what a lot of writers and creatives should also sort of take on board. Art invites us to know beauty and to solicit it, summon it from even the most tragic of circumstances. And uh, that really resonated with me because, you know, in such a sort of challenging time, um, my writing sort of helped me, saved me, supported me um in such you know such an intense period um i know for many people um the pandemic has been very 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 traumatic um from 
just generally being in a pandemic and from um, being um, a, a black person, um, a person of color um, and people who are often marginalized as well. It's been a very challenging time. I know people who have um, either been ill, um, who have had bereavements um, and my condolences go out to you um, as well. Um, so one of the things I just want to start with is just giving ourselves a, a hug. <laughs> it's really, you know, tough times. Um, so just know that you are, you are safe. You are, you know, there are people that can support you. And I will go through and talk a little bit about that as well. So give yourself a hug. <laughs> Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, I was born in the year of 1970. So those of you who are mathematicians or those of you who are also born in the same year or who um, just, just know the years <laughs> will know that I'm 51. Um, I'm a proud daughter of very proud Jamaican parents. Um, both my parents are um, octogenarians um, um was raised in the borough of Lewisham in southeast London in the UK. Uh, during my time at school, I was very, very passionate about drawing, painting, anything to do with art. I loved it. And I also discovered that I love to write and tell stories as well. Um, and I think that kind of um, took me through to my sort of later years in secondary school. So while I, when I got into secondary school, I was sort of really started to embrace English language and English literature. And we studied poetry. And I remember reading the works of um, um, Louise Bennett, the Jamaican, the amazing Jamaican poet. Um, and I couldn't believe that I was learning about her at school. Um, and then I went on to the um, well, Southampton Solent University. And I studied um, graphic design and illustration. And for me, illustration was also a form of uh, storytelling as well. Um, those of you who know me or uh, who have shared stage with me or been in um, writing spaces with me, I am this year I'm celebrating 20 years of being a professional poet. And those of you who have also um, you know, started that around the same time as me. I congratulate you as well. Um, obviously, with the pandemic, performance spaces haven't been, um, you know, <laughs> there haven't been many. But thankfully, we have these online um, platforms to do that, which is great. So welcome, Zoom. I mean, when I think about Zoom, I didn't even know anything about this, this virtual platform. I, only Zoom that I was ref, that I could remember was the song Zoom. Um, some of you may know that, but, but now it's something that I use regularly. So I mentioned a little bit about why I want to do this, but if I go a little bit deeper as well, um, and I'll take you to the sort of beginning of the lockdown period. So this picture that I'm showing you here, this is probably one of the last pictures I took before our pandemics took its grip on us um, in the UK and before you know, we had to wear masks um, and that, that mask wearing was mandatory. So um, this is probably, if I recall about a couple of weeks before we officially went into lockdown. And then this uh, <laughs> next photo, a few photos, this um, you'll see, see the mask that has come out. Um, in the large one, um, I'm smiling a little bit, but it was actually during a time when uh, my um, husband had um, uh, unfortunately got um, COVID. So I was nursing him and I was, um, you know, trying to juggle so many things, including being working from home 
Um, also, he is diabetic. I'm sure he won't mind me sharing this. He's diabetic and has um, hypertension. So I had to make sure the food that I created and cooked was, um, was useful for him. Um, as we know that a lot of people who are, um, who have um, diabetes, um, you know, they, they're very vulnerable and susceptible to, to COVID. So it was, it was just a lot to sort of um, juggle, a lot to process, a lot to deal with. And I was also hearing about people who have been impacted by the, by the pandemic in terms of their health um, and people, sadly, that I knew personally who passed away and people that I knew who in their families, they were, you know, um, bereaved. Um, also at this time, these three names probably were, you know, became very well known, Breonna, Armand, Armand and George. Um, we know that these three people were unlawfully killed during this time. And the Black Lives Matter movement became more prominent and on a global level, um, their deaths were highlighted and more focus was placed on the fact that Black Lives Matter um, amongst everybody. Um, and I think at this time, that's, this is where the intensity started to sort of really become a lot. Um, and it made me um, think about uh, myself um, and my own intersectionality. Um, it made me become more aware of it. And um, being a, a black woman, being black, being a woman, being a Christian, being a woman who was 50 and over 50, um, being British and being of Jamaican heritage, so many things were overlapping and intersecting. And it was almost sort of the, the weight of it that made me realize that there are so many things that have to be addressed. And, and, and also I had to kind of take a step back when I realized the enormity of everything that I was processing. Thankfully at my place of work, um, there were spaces created where we could actually have these discussions and talk about what was happening with um, regards to the global global black trauma and also the Black Lives Matter movement, how that impacted um, black people in different spaces, especially in the in a workspace. Um, also looking at how allies could support us. And I think it was also at this time that I was becoming more, more triggered and, um, and also just thinking about um, the fact that with all that was happening, I was still carrying around things that I didn't realize I was. Um, so I was kind of thinking about the 1970s, which is the decade, my first decade of life. Um, there was a lot of things happening that as a child, I thought I processed and I'd realized I hadn't. And as an at 50 year old or 50 plus adult, um, this hadn't left, this was still there. Um, so I was reminded about a poem that I wrote, and it was actually, I think I wrote in 2014, and it was based on um, what was then termed the Battle of Lewisham, which was the National Front March in Lewisham in um, August of 1977. So I was seven years old at the time. Um, so I'm going to share the poem with you, which is called National Front March in Lewisham, um, 14th, 13th of August, 1977. I am seven. Earlier, Trevor MacDonald is on the news. He looks like my uncle. Same thick rimmed glasses, bits of gray speckled at the sides of his small round afro. 
Trevor tells us lots of people are marching through Lewisham High Street with big banners, some white with black white writing shouting at black people. I can now overlook the rooftops and high blocks of Lewisham from my black garden wall on tiptoes. The alley behind our garden where monsters roam, where National Front men sleep. Scary, angry faced with spray cans in their hands. Where nasty, hateful words are made up. Fuzzy blue up and down slanted lines spelling NF. Sprayed on the side of white wall on the street below, made of bumpy concrete. I have learnt a new word, darky. My sister and me smile and wave at our neighbours two doors down when they say, hello, darky. We always say, hello, back, until my brothers said, darky is a bad word and they are not our real friends. My neighbours next door to them are old and shout horrible words over our garden fence to my brothers, sister, cousin and me, like the men Trevor mentioned. Now, I am seven. I can tiptoe to look out for these men shouting angry, horrible words. Lucian High Street is not far from us. I listen out for loud male voices of the National Front. I think I hear darky blowing in the breeze brought in from the distance. I used to wonder what NF was. Now I am seven. I know how to write NF, but don't want to. Thank you. So um, I, yeah, I was sort of reminded of these things that were happening and I realized that you know, things hadn't really changed. What, what do you do? How do you cope? So I, I was now trying to figure out how do I cope with COVID, um, with, you know, what's happening, the, 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 you know, dealing with that, looking after people, um, looking after yourself, um, and, um, and also just what was happening in the news. And I realized that, you know, it was just really kind of, kind of coming in closely on me, which really, I just felt like I was just being so overwhelmed. And um, I realized that I just needed to kind of do things to, um, to just process this and get, you know, just get through it. And, um, I did things like, you know, taking myself off social media um, to the point where, you know, I was missing for a while and people actually messaged me to ask if I was okay. Um, um, I made sure I sort of found, checked in with my GP. I, um, the resources at our workplace that have been really helpful, um, employee, um, um, employee program that allows you to receive um, uh, support. I checked in with a counsellor um, and also reached out to my friends, family, um, people at work, you know, and also, but I also wanted to make sure I was strong enough to help those who are also going through tough times. So as I mentioned, my husband had um, COVID, which didn't expect. Um, so um, I started to um, get in touch with people from our um, Malika's Kitchen alumni um, group um, community, um, Sandra Lawrence being one of them. Um, and, you know, having writing body sessions um, um, we've reformed the, um, we've just got together a, a group of us who could meet from the alumni um, to write and talk and just hold space together. And through one of my sort of budding sessions, free write sessions, I um, came up with this poem, which is called Vigil. The bedside gray plastic bucket remains empty. 
I watch for the movement of your chest and tummy. Check your stomach's fullness. I have no thermometer, but use my hand to gauge your heat. The 111 doctor is loud on the phone. Is his chest hot? Is his stomach hot? Is his cough persistent? Can he hear you? You are deeply asleep, unaware of my nods and yeses. I tell the doctor, boiled lemon and ginger is your staple. No garlic as it lowers blood pressure. COVID lowers it enough. Doctor says, good job, I think. Each night, I sit perched on the end of our bed. It's two weeks since I joined you, since you fainted on the bedside cabinet, since I caught your groan and fall, patted your face, cradled your head on my bended knees. From YouTube, a Psalm 91 audio is loud and on repeat. Each night I just stare at you in this dimly lit bedroom over my blue mask, twist my wedding and engagement rings to face forward. They slide easily on a slimmer finger. Thank you. So, um, I had to sort of, as I said, just continue with this, looking at this route to, for healing and, you know, finding steps to move towards this. And um, as I mentioned, I was, I had to look at ways to sort of self check in and become self aware. And I think it's very important that we do that. Sometimes we know we don't realize what we, what's happening, what we're going through and Self-checking in can, you know, be a, a case of forming a community, um, getting, reaching out to people, um, checking in with your GP. Um, what I would say as well is, you know, whatever you hear from that I present from this um, presentation, do also check, always check in with your GP first um, and then just check the things that will the route that will be best for you. And I'm just sharing what was useful for me. Um, and it's so important just to ask yourself, you know, how you're doing, um, how you're feeling. And this is where free writing came in very handy. Um, walking through, doing, going on my walks, writing on my phone or dictating on my phone. Um, if you have smartphones, I just really recommend that you utilize that tool. Um, but I, I was doing a lot of that just to sort of get through. One of the things that was, I felt was very important as well was, you know, wanting to try and get, move forward. But when you're in pain and you're carrying so much on an emotional level around with you you want to get to a destination but you have to kind of be well in yourself first of all so this is where I sort of took the opportunity to kind of reset and refuel so that I could move forward um one of the things um that I where I work I was very 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 fortunate in that a space was created where I could share some of these tips and, and tools as well. So I actually did a presentation which was called Reset and Refuel. Um, so one of the most important things is to sort of rest and keep yourself hydrated. During this time, obviously wearing masks, um, it gets very, very challenging. Um, so I found that when I wasn't doing that, it was difficult and I did actually have some health issues um, last year as well. I didn't realize and I, and, and I think it was down to the fact that I was wearing the masks um, and not hydrating properly. But one of the also most important things and vital things as a creative is to ensure that you tap into your creative gifts. I believe that we all have 
some gift or another. And um, it's very, 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 very important to utilize that and using your creativity and writing can aid you in, in your well-being. And I'm gonna sort of share a little bit to my other resources that might be useful a little bit later. It was a, another quote by the wonderful Alice Walker, um, which again, I think, which is so important and vital to people who are creatives. Um, whenever you are creating beauty around you, you are restoring your own soul. I think, you know, just taking a moment to take in those words and it, it just kind of reminds us really that when you, use your creativity, you are tapping into what's inside of you and sharing that um, beauty around you. It is beauty. What you, what you have is your gift. Um, and to be able to share that with someone is, is a gift in itself. You just don't know what your, your gift um, can do to others. And in the meantime, you're also restoring your own soul, which is so vital and so important. And I found that that's what I had to keep going to, you know, to do. Another important thing was just to find spaces that support you. Um, that could be writing spaces, community groups um, that, you know, that can make you feel um, supported, um, valid. Um, I, um, I had the privilege also of, of um, working with a wonderful organization called um, Therapy for Healing, also known as T4H. And they're a social enterprise based in Lewisham. And I, came on board um, to work as a sort of facilitator, a coach and a befriender. And um, the idea was that people would um, get in touch with them through being referred or via um, a social prescribing um, facility. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the term social prescribing or social prescribers, it's a sort of um, a way for us to receive uh, wellness treatment without um, uh, non-medicinal wellness treatment. So social prescribers are, um, you can get referred for it via your GP to reach out to either um, a community space, to um, activities that are, are there to support wellness. Um, and, in my list of resources, I, I think I'll share, I believe I shared a link to information about social prescribers. So that's something you can check with your GP. Um, so I use my, my gifts as the writer to, to support people um, by doing sort of writing exercises, writing um, lists of, uh, you know, what you're grateful for. So writing a gratitude list, that is a really powerful thing to do. And also um, writing affirmations, which are very, very useful. Something that you can maybe try and look at doing is creating um, affirmations using um, the haiku model. Um, that's it's it's, um, it's a really powerful way of 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 sort of reaffirming yourself and reaffirm who you are. So you can use the phrase, I am, and then write that in the haiku. Haiku being um, a poem of three lines. The first line is five, uses five syllables. The second line uses seven syllables. And the third line uses five syllables. And haikus are usually sort of connected with nature as well. Green spaces, we often now, Again, certain, certain, certain terms I became more familiar with. Green spaces, outdoor green spaces are, um, you know, I gravitated to them a lot. But also um, I brought the green, 
greenery inside. So in my writing space, in my home, as you can see in, in, in this picture, I, I've got plants on the windowsill and the plants are now sort of overtaking me, but it's, it, when I can't get outside, it's been so helpful. And I really would sort of encourage you to, even if you find a cheap plant and be a cue of something, which is what I did and just watch them, help them to grow. That nurturing process is so helpful and useful. And I, when I'm writing, I sit in cocooned in that space if I can't get outside. And blue spaces being by water. Um, I often find that, you know, that's really helpful for me. This was, the picture was taken um, one of the first times my husband and I were able to, to get out and we went to, well, to go on a train journey. We went to Brighton. Um, it was in July of 2000, last year, 2020. And just having that time there, looking out at the sea and even writing, get, dictating your writing, which is so useful. Green and blue spaces combined has also been really beneficial um, and something that, again, being in those two spaces um, and writing has been really helpful and just, just really aiding my um, well-being as well. So this was taken on one of my many walks um, near where I live and there's a lovely stream there as well and there's a little mini waterfall which I just gravitate to so much. I actually went for a walk there for the first time in ages yesterday and I just felt so much happier and I felt the load had sort of lifted a lot. So um, feel free to, where I share resources and any links, feel free if you have the, the facility to screenshot, do a screenshot, um, you're more than welcome to do a screenshot of this page. And this is sort of places where you can find support and self-care tools. So as I mentioned, your GP, um, social prescribing, um, finding ways to do that for a counsellor. There's also the Black Minds Matter um, site, um, which allows you to find black therapists um, if you feel that would be better for you. Blackmindsmatter.uk.com. Sorry, blackmindsmatteruk.com. Um, going to your employee assistance program within your job. A lot of employees have that. Um, if you are in a, in a nine to five job, seeking out um, a life wellness coach, reaching out to your family, friendship groups, and taking a time of social media. I, I just, that was one of the best things that I did. And that was helpful, really was helpful. Um, give me one minute. So I'm you know, just gonna go more into depth about how writing helped me. And I hope that how it can help you all as well. Um, so finding a safe space to write and a, a safe space, a physical safe physical space, as well as a safe emotional space. I think that's really important where you feel that you can be vulnerable with your writing and um, you can feel, feel vulnerable about what you're sharing. Um, I, was very fortunate to um, find sort of workshop spaces and um, also get back in touch with the Malaika's Kitchen alumni group just to um, to write and it's just been one of the best things I've done and um, but also that whole writing process is very cathartic and as a lot of writers know a lot of writers write from a place of, of, of authenticity and of lived experiences. So that can also help. Um, I mentioned writing buddies, um, um, finding writing mentor and writer development groups. I'm part of the um, Inscribe uh, Writers Development Program. Um, I'm an Inscribe Writers member, which is which supports writers of um, black and Asian origin. Um, and again, I'll include information about that group in um, the in a 
in a further link, um, a slide further down. So as I mentioned, writing communities, just know that you're not alone. It's so important not to be isolated <clears throat> during this period. And some of the, the groups I mentioned um, in Scribe, um, Malaika's Poetry Kitchen this year has also um, celebrated 20 years um, and it also coincided that with the launch of a new um, no, um, publication. Um, so feel free to screenshot this page as well. The Inscribe um, program is, is managed by the amazing writers Dorothy Smart and Khadija George. Um, so there will be a link there if you want to find out more information. Writing tools, again, feel free to screenshot this page. Um, journaling, gratitude lists, free writes, walking in nature and writing, even writing to music, trying to create music. Um, I was doing a little bit of that, using a voice recording um, and writing a script of the future. So actually writing about how you want things to be as well in the future. Um, there are very there are many different ways to create for us to create our narratives um, through poetry, short fiction, blogging, vlogging, songwriting, writing quotes and memes and all sorts of things. Um, and that's something that I was doing a lot of. I resurrected my YouTube channel to, to create some video memes. So you can have a look at that um, further down the line. Um, expanding the narrative and um, what I mean by this is finding ways to rewrite the narrative of black people how um, we're not just about trauma there's so much more to us there's so much more to 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 for us to share and um, finding different mediums to do this is so important and vital Again, in my workspace, I had an opportunity to produce a poetry film and collaborated with some wonderful musicians, writers, and our um, and filmmaking team to do that. Um, also, have um, I, I she, she may be on the call, um, B Manzini, who runs um, the Caramel um, Film Club, and as a she's a wonderful, amazing poet, and she has combined a poetry and a passion of filmmaking. So these are other ways in which you can use, utilize poetry through the medium of film, um, but just definitely explore that. So um, again, mentioned some resources, sorry, I've mentioned some um, support methods and things that you can use. I've also here got a list of resources. This will be shared later as well. Um, so again, you can screenshot this, but it will be shared later also. I'm just aware of time, so I'm, I'm just going to kind of conclude. So I was watching, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the um, Red Table Talks, which are hosted by uh, Jada Pinkett Smith, um, her daughter Willow and, and her mother. And they share all sorts of things and they, they speak from places of authenticity and they're quite vulnerable in what they share. And I was just watching one recently. And one of the things that I, they said, and I thought, oh, this is a really, really good thing to use. And what is your superpower? Now, we may not see ourselves as being powerful or super, but we should. <laughs> and, you know, for us to be here today, um, and to, to go through what we've been through, um, we have a superpower. So it could be a gift. Um, it could be um, something we, we're very good at, you know, where it's a gift of listening, being compassionate, gift of writing. We should embrace those as our superpower. So it's something to think about. And I think it's something, you know, look into that and write about that as well. Write that down or identify that. Also, it's so important to, for us to give ourselves self-recognition and to self-congratulate, um, you know, um, by celebrating our strengths and our accomplishments. And 
in that it helps to build our resilience. Now, the reason why I've got this plant pot here is that um, I became, I don't know, I, my fingers became green out during this time. And I had to, you know, lots of plants that I just would, I would ordinarily wouldn't have been able to grow. You know, there was a stage where even my plastic plants died. It was that bad. Um, so I, I gained this gift of being able to look after plants. So um, again, just another self hug, um, take some deep breaths and exhale, um, take a few deep breaths in and exhale. Um, because, you know, we're all carrying a lot um, with us. Um, what you can also do is look at sort of ways to, to be mindful or, or incorporate mindfulness on your walks where you're taking deep breaths um, or if you're not walking, sit down. And this is something I did with um, an alumni group on Sunday was just to take a few deep breaths in and exhale. And then when you've reached a place where, um, where you're happy and you visualize yourself walking through greenery and maybe sitting down by water, think about what images come to you and then and then write and you'll be surprised with what you can actually what you actually come up with so um i'm gonna sort of finalize with this poem which was came about from being in a my a green and blue space and um it's called lake beside the green the woodland pigeon dips its head further into shrubs it's gone behind the green reeds of, of lilac, Himalayan balsam, the opening of the lake behind it. We are here now, walk past the widening mouth of the lake and a wooden bench on its side. You like the woodland, the peace and the tranquility. We hear old leaves break off, tumble through the trees, sounds like rainfall. The leaves land by shoes, in the quiet, we can hear the, wash, the hushed water flow and the woodland pigeon's song. I complain about being tired, the lack of iron, the low white blood count, the recent blood tests. A week ago, the sharp scratch, my bottled blood. Now I can breathe deeply for the first time in months. <laughs> As you and I pose to take a selfie, I introduce you to portrait mode, bokeh dup, depth function blurs, the green lake behind and the light blue sky above. Our blue masks rest beneath our chins, the sun on our, on our faces, our heads touching. Thank you. Um, so I've got, resources on my website and this is the film I made poetry and film um, you can scan the QR code if you're able to a screenshot again I can provide that link later on um, another quote this was one by, that I came up with um, create or be the inspiration you want to receive so sometimes instead of looking out look within to find that inspiration um, you can subscribe to what I do. Again, you can um, screenshot this page or use a um, scan a QR code and then subscribe when you get through to the page. And again, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, and um, it's been a pleasure to share with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that, Patricia. Um, what I, one of the things that I really loved about your presentation was how um, practical it was. Um, one of the questions that I had, um, you mentioned, excuse me, you mentioned about tapping into your um, creative gifts. Because we are still going through a pandemic and also having absorbed so much with um, the, the, the visibility of uh, black trauma, 
Um, how do you uh, tap into your creative gifts if you're dealing with things like fear, trauma, grief, and so on? You, you may just feel frozen, you know, or unable to tap into that. Have you got any suggestions in that regard? That's a really, really good question because, um, you know, there was definitely a time where I just felt I just couldn't move I couldn't function properly um I just didn't know how I was going to get through you know different days um but I had to start by kind of acknowledging that that I was going through this um that I was experiencing these challenges and then reaching out to people finding out who I that who could help me um and again, sometimes that can be difficult in, in itself, but it's, I think it's knowing who you've got around you, who you can feel vulnerable with. I think that's the first step. And then um, knowing what support is available. So, um, and how to um, also feel well, to be in a space where you are, your wellness is, is being supported. So um, again, reaching out to people, um, having chats and then going for walks. I think that's where that started. I had to just get out and move. So I think it's important to just initially move, find ways to move. Um, so I would just walk with my mask on, my rucksack. You know, people always say, what have you got in that rucksack? Um, but just have everything I need carry a mat with me if I need to sit down if I need to walk and cry I did that many times um you know and then find a space where you feel comfortable and then you know I found my happy space being by the little waterfall in a park near where I live it's only a 10 minute walk from where I live and um some people if you can find a space or green space do that green space is so healing so I had to do that and then what I found was that I was um when thoughts were coming in my mind I I released them so I recorded them I used my phone to record however silly it sounded so I, I utilized you know the technology my phone um which I have all the time with me um so even recording something you don't it may sound silly Sometimes there are dictating tools that you can use where you, you, you speak and it, it's everything's transcribed. So that's already then becomes in, in an electronic format. And then bringing, identifying spaces where you, your creativity can, can be supported. Um, if you're into drawing, you know, maybe go find sort of online spaces where you, or videos that you can just follow. And it takes time and you also have to just be kind to yourself. Um, so that, I mean, it's that starting point, finding that and then finding the spaces and then being able to open up and feel vulnerable. Mm, I hope that's, that's helpful. Yeah, that makes uh, um, a lot of sense. Um, and you mentioned also in your talk about, you know, free writing, walking, staying off social media. I think one of the things that we're not always aware of um, is the impact of being exposed to repeated images of yeah. trauma yeah. Um, and just uh, constant reminders of... Um, how little value uh, black lives seem to have. We're one year on, a little more than one year on, uh, from the um, the uprisings of the summer mm. of 2020, but there are still a constant stream of stories that have come out of another person having been killed and so on. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what we can do um, as individuals um, to... Um, or feel that we're creating community and stepping up in the way that we can, because obviously not everybody can go out on the front line. Sometimes yeah. you do have to focus more on your own, um, on your own self-care. 
Is, yes. Are there any uh, suggestions that you have about how we can reach out and create community for each other? What are some ways that we can do that and what role it would play? Yeah, so that's, again, that's a very good question. Again, uh, I mean, with some, a lot of people, um, socialising or networking is done via social media or by the use of technology. Um, it's also, and I think, and I, what I found of me was that I, I had been in a space where I've been using technology and social media over the years, and I just forgotten the, the simple method of picking up the phone and speaking to people that has had gone out the window. So I had to incorporate that and it actually got me back in touch with people who, you know, I had maybe just not been communicating with by phone. Um, so even just doing that and having conversations, <laughs> whether it's, I mean, yeah, I've been on recently on phone calls with people where I've been on the phone for about four or five hours. Mm. Um, they used to do that back in the day and I hadn't done that. So that, that kind of came back into play. So I think having those conversations, finding your tribe, um, which is so important. Um, there are, yes, there are people or, or individuals or maybe people in our workspaces or communities who are maybe not for us are not, part of a tribe or not like-minded we need to then focus on those who are our tribe or who are like-minded or who we feel comfortable with however small that is and connecting with them I think is a great starting point because you can have then have um you know you, you might have somebody who knows somebody else who can help you with something and that that's happened where by um a friend of mine um i knew of the well the the i mentioned it the therapy for healing place um and i felt you know she would be a perfect fit so she was able to um i hope she doesn't mind she, i'm not identifying her but I, um, I know she's on the call and she was able to connect with them so sometimes by having a conversation we can then be we then realize that uh, somebody over here has this resource that might be useful. Or we know somebody else who has a resource um, and it doesn't have to be on, on social media. And also, as I mentioned, with the social prescribing um, process, um, at, that was something that was very new to me. Um, going via your GP, they can then find, instead of providing, you know, prescribing medication, they can prescribe a social um, community or a space that can enable your well-being, um, and it could then lead on to um, being part of a class or a community. That's that's kind of a, a safe way, really, just to kind of open up and a, a safe space to be. I hope that answers. Yes, it does. And it also covers um, a couple of the comments that, that we had from the audience in the um, Q&A, where a few people have mentioned about um, not being able to get the support that they needed from their GP and what the alternatives are. So I think what you said about social prescribing, um, and there's been a number of links and other um, resources that people can go to, mm. that would be really helpful. One of the questions um, that we've got is from Jai, who's been writing a book for nearly a year, which is semi-autobiographical, but she struggles um, with health and disability. So her question is about how do you maintain uh, motivation and focus to you know, power through and complete a piece of creative work when you do have not only the social uh, issues that are going on but your yeah. own particularly health issues yeah that's um and thank you so much for reaching out Jai and um and um you know I wish you just wellness wherever you know possible and congratulations on writing your book 
um, I think that's the first step to actually just write uh, write it. Um, in terms of finding um, being a, finding a motivation, um, you know, t which obviously might be challenging because of your your health conditions is it's again I suppose it's the sort of being able to find spaces or uh, networks that can help and assist I'm not sure of of the your accessibility needs but um and the GP route might be a challenge for some people but um trying the social prescribing route might be, be useful um and also if you just sometimes as well if we have we're writing or we're doing a piece of creativity we may not necessarily want to share it with other people and I think it's that time where we if we again we have our those people who are close to us and we have our tribe is to open up and share um I have a another friend um so he's on this call and she um has for years had also been looking to write and she just went and, and did it and it's it's easier said than done um she's now on her written this released a second book and she's on to her third um but i think she she had to um she did reach out but she went went down the self publication route as well um there are i'm just trying to think of um it also oh if you it depends on your where you're located as well because you could maybe check in with your your library i don't know sometimes libraries have online online facilities um but you you can maybe find resources that way um but there might be groups that are um if you maybe check for, for groups or writing groups that are supportive of people with accessibility needs or um th that might be a great starting point as well um but also, yeah, just it, it, again, it goes back to that community thing and not doing it in, in isolation. Um, um, but, you know, there are some links that I hope that might be helpful to you, um, or if I, which we'll share at the end. Um, but, but the motivation thing, going back to the motivation thing as well, um, I think it's even if you I don't know if you have access to an outdoor space or a garden or um, a balcony um, even and and this time of year it's also the lack of sunlight or daylight which can lower our vitamin D so keeping your nutrition up is vital as well because that can help with your mood so making sure your vitamin D is topped up um, through just exposing yourself, even sitting by the window, which I'm doing right now, or if you're able to um, open the back door, if that's helpful, sit on the balcony, have some plants and then have that greenery in nature so that you can feel your mood is uplifted. I think that also can help you to, to, to help your motivation and doing a free write as well. First thing in the morning, just writing whatever comes in your mind if you feel a minute something comes in your your mind write that down as well um we've got a thank you for that patricia uh, there's another question from samia um who was asking whether over the past 20 years of your writing if you found that your writing um uh, fell into different periods for instance did the nature of your work change during uh, the pandemic and the impact of the black lives matter movement uh, were, were you interested in writing different types of things did it affect your creative process um okay, yeah it's a very very good question um i um i found that I, as a Christian, I don't ordinarily speak publicly publicly about my faith or write about it. But I found that I was doing more so doing that more so during 
this um, pandemic season. And um, because I relied on my faith a lot to help me get through this also, this period. So um, tapping into things like the Psalms, um, which in its in essence are, is poetry in the Bible. And I was reading a lot of that, listening to videos online and playing that. And I mentioned that in one of my poems, playing that over and over. Um, so I found that I was writing more about my faith. So that's kind of shifted um, and how, and, and, and being quite open to saying how that is impacted with me without being, um, making people feel uncomfortable uh, as sometimes um, religion can. Um, and also writing about being in a pandemic, that in itself is just something that, you know, I've never had to do before and a lot of people haven't. So again, writing was very cathartic, but writing about the emotion of it, um, I think helped me to get through it. And I know where I've shared it with other people, that's been helpful as well. So definitely, um, yes, that shift. And then also when, when I got married a few years ago, I started writing more about being married. Um, and um, my husband appears in a few of my poems. So, yeah, so I suppose a lot, yeah, I suppose in the last couple of years, more so the last eight months during this pandemic, it's really just shifted writing. And I've had to, where I felt traumatized, I've just had to write about it. Yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah, so, it, I mean, we met uh, when we were doing uh, on the performance poetry circuit. Yes. So with the kind of writing that you're doing, which is much more um, uh, personal and intimate and about your own process, how much of that do you choose to share? Or, or are you selective about how you share that and how much of that you put into the world as a public kind of performer? Again, very good question. Um, I think, well, not I think, I know as a writer, we have, um, you know, um, creative license to, to write what is true and what isn't true. Um, if it isn't true, you can make it appear true. Mm -hmm. But um, I have, I found that I have written a, a lot of, a lot of my poetry has been written about things that have been personal, um, but personal, but things that I felt could, other people could relate to. Um, so, We've written about um, my family, which I write about a lot. Growing up, um, being a, um, a black female child um, in the UK, writing a lot about that. Also writing about um, relationships um, that have been easy or difficult. And writing about, um, now, as I mentioned, just starting to write more about my faith um so uh, yeah i would say maybe 60 percent of what right is true mm -hmm. i think <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah so i think when i write it and then i've then i've once it's on a paper i've kind of let it go mm -hmm. um so that's now out in the domain for public domain for people to read so um and and also i think i have to be mindful of what i share that if it's personal but something that is is um useful and easy for me to share and it doesn't you know there aren't any safe safeguarding issues involved but um yeah i think um things are, that are personal and relatable that i tend to share well, thank you so much, Patricia. Uh, this has been a really interesting and provoking conversation. And I also think well, um, well needed um, in these times. So um, I'd like to just uh, thank you for, for spending this time. And again, apologies to the audience for the technical issues that we had at the beginning, but we're really grateful that you uh, stayed with us um, and got the benefit of listening to Patricia's wonderful advice. 
Um, a quick reminder that this event has been recorded and will be put up at our blog site. Um, the link will be shared in the chat. Um, our next event will be on the 10th of February and it's on mental health in mixed race people. And this is at 6 p.m. You'll be able to register for that event on the blog site. So thank you all so much for attending and thank you again, Patricia, for sharing with us. Pleasure, absolute pleasure. Thank you, everyone.